Commissioner Jack Cagle established Harris County Precinct 4's Biological Control Initiative in 2012 and tasked it to find and develop biological mosquito control methods. Biological control expands to arsenal in the fight against mosquito-borne diseases in a systematic approach by using nature against nature and enlisting organisms that prey upon the pest in various ways. Dedicated scientists and technicians research and apply biological control agents within Harris County and concentrate their efforts in preserves and parklands. Before we dive deeper, let's define biological control and its agents. Biological control is an active human management method of reducing or controlling pests such as insects, mites, weeds, and plant diseases by using other organisms. It relies on predation, parasitism, and herbivory. Biological pest control falls into three basic categories. Traditional or importation, where a natural enemy of a pest is introduced in the hope of achieving control. Augmentation, in which a large population of natural enemies are administered for quick pest control. And inoculative or conservation methods, in which measures are taken to maintain natural enemies through regular re-establishment. Natural enemies of insect pests are known as biological control agents, and they can include predators, parasitoids, microbes, and pathogens. Predators may feed on targets as juveniles or adults or both. Dragonflies and damselflies spend their early development stages in water, actively hunting or waiting in ambush to catch creatures swimming by. Adults glean insects right off of vegetation or catch flying insects on the wing. Ladybird beetles and green lacewings fall into the same category and so does the mosquito insects. Parasitoids rely on a host to complete the life cycle. Many parasitoids are very host specific to a single species or closely related group of animals, and usually they kill their host. Trichogramma wasps invade and consume caterpillar eggs. Braconid wasps devour caterpillars from their den. Mermethid nematodes infect and develop inside mosquito larvae and kill their mosquito larvae hosts before they can pupate and fly off. Most biological control practitioners and scientists work in agricultural settings, in greenhouse or forestry, and exotic invasive pest control applications. Due to the complexity and locally varying mosquito diversity and abundance, only a few laboratories work towards finding biological controls that are useful against mosquitoes. When incorporated into pest management programs, biological control enhances the effectiveness of pesticides and can reduce the need for their application. Pesticide overuse and misuse can result in many unintended and often dire consequences. Besides pollution and decimating non-target animals, the overuse of mosquito pesticides can allow them to develop resistance, which of course diminishes the insecticide effect. The research and development of a biological control agent at BCI begins with identifying native organisms that show potential to impact the intended target without harming non-targets or causing negative ecological effects. We consider peer-reviewed literature and conduct our own field surveys for these potential candidates. BCI develops cost-effective methods to produce the biocontrol agents it uses for research and for field deployment. The potential agent is also evaluated in the laboratory and in semi-controlled settings to identify its limitations, its ideal applications, and to ascertain its efficacy to reduce the pest mosquito populations. Biological and life cycle assays, predation rate impact studies, abundance and diversity surveys, and mark release recapture studies keep the team busy. Conservation projects emphasize habitat design and management strategies to prevent mosquito populations and encourage the establishment of natural enemy populations. But let's have a closer look at some of the agents currently in evaluation and use at BCI. Let's meet some of the creatures at the BCI lab. 
The mosquito assassin is known to scientists as Toxorhynchitis rubius. Mosquito assassins are two-winged insects and belong to the order of fruit flies. They are further categorized with mosquitoes, but unlike their well-known cousins that have a bad rep for being the world's most dangerous animal, mosquito assassins don't bite man nor animal. In fact, through millennia-long adaptations, mosquito assassins evolved to forego a blood meal and store the nutrients obtained as juveniles to use later on in adulthood. Adults gather energy through floral nectar much like butterflies and flower flies do. Toxorhynchitis rutilis is native to the eastern United States where it can be found flitting about moist shady forests and mature lush landscapes. Deep rain water filled tree holes are its favorite breeding habitat, but in a pinch the female will also lay her eggs into other available watery places. She'll turn neglected bird baths, water barrels, clogged gutters, derelict ponds and fountains even pet dishes and outdoor toys into makeshift nurseries for her offspring, as do a number of other species of the biting kind, of which a couple species pose a real threat to us by being able to transmit disease-causing viruses. Once a female mosquito assassin has found a watery habitat that suits her, she'll place her eggs onto the surface by tossing them, just a few at a time, aiming carefully to ensure her bouncy ping-pong ball-like eggs are near food. She'll divvy up her egg laying over a few weeks and place eggs here and there. She'll try hard to avoid placing all her eggs into just one basket, but overall she's a homebody with a relatively short dispersal range of less than a mile. Embryos develop and close from their eggs in less than two days. A fragile, newly hatched mosquito assassin larva must wait for its exoskeleton to harden. But after about an hour or so, the delicate little squiggle turns prowess hunter insatiably hungry and grabbing at any nearby movement, including younger cohorts that are just wiggling free from their eggs. Young mosquito assassins earn their name with a ferocious appetite for anything wiggling by in range. Most often, their prey is made up of other mosquito larvae. A single mosquito assassin can devour several hundred mosquito larvae during its time developing in the water. Depending on the season and food availability, a mosquito assassin larva can grow from egg to pupa in under two weeks and into a fully winged adult in just three weeks' time. During searing summer heat and drought, late instar larvae may wait a bit in a state of quiescence. Battened up late instar larvae survive frosty winter in their waters by completely suspending development in diapause until temperatures warm and daylight hours signal springtime. As with most true flies, the mosquito assassin undergoes a pupation phase. The fourth and final instar larva sheds its exoskeleton once more and turns its energy in. A pupa forms, metamorphosis begins, and the adult develops within. Oddly enough, the breathing aperture changes from the larva's snorkel-like siphon to a pair of trumpets located towards the front and top of the pupa. The pupa does not feed in its new body style. Its locomotion also changes from the wiggly larva motion to a tumbling one, somersaulting through the water column when disturbed by shadow or nearby movement. After four to six days, it will push itself just above the water meniscus, allowing the newly formed, up, formed adult to pull itself out of its old shell right into the dry air. The change is as miraculous as it is in butterflies, and the new adult insect sports brilliant iridescent scales and hues from golden to sapphire blue and cherry purple. Now, flying in air, it no longer needs to suck in air through tubes, and it will lose those trumpets and instead sport holes in their places. Males develop a day or so ahead of females, but stick closely to the nursery side once out of the water. There they wait for females to emerge. The time spent waiting is filled with dodging predators and waiting for the genitalia to mature and rotate by 180 degrees. Males can be easily recognized by their plumos, fuzzy antennae, which are intensely sensitive female pheromone detectors. Mating takes place in midair and pairs fall several feet downward. And this is a precarious time for the pair, for if they fall onto water and their wings get wet, one or both may drown. The genetic material transfer only takes a few seconds, and afterward the adults fly off to find sugary plant juices. Females also fly off and search for new places to overposit their eggs into, and the entire cycle starts anew. 
Let's have a closer look at an entomal pathogen and meet the parasitoid myrmethid nematode Romanomyrmus pulisivorax. Nematodes in general are worm-like arthropods with smooth, mostly round bodies. Theirs is a very large and diverse group, and scientists estimate 25 to 40,000 distinct species to exist, though the number could very easily be tenfold greater. For every human on Earth, there are about 60 billion nematodes, making them account for nearly 80% of all individual animals on Earth. Nematodes are found everywhere on Earth and in every ecosystem. They're ubiquitous in freshwater, marine, and terrestrial environments in all the regions between the poles, in mountains, deserts, tropical jungle, boreal forests, and prairie plains, even in oceanic trenches. They've even been collected in soil samples taken from 12,000 feet below the surface. A high number of them are pathogenic or parasitic on plants and animals, causing disease, even demise. Many of the more specialized species are entomopathogenic on invertebrates, manipulate its behavior and life by producing toxins inside their hosts. Scientists study their applications, and a few are already being utilized as biocontrol agents and commercially available. Most biological control with nematodes as agents is centralized in agricultural applications to deal with soil and plant pests, and a few species are actually available in retail for garden pest management. These top soil level dwellers are reputed to, among others, to reduce fire ants and dung beetle grubs that damage lawns. Since 2019, these nematodes are also found in space. Through a collaboration with NASA, a California-based biotech firm sent its biocontrol nematodes to the National Laboratory on the International Space Station. Less glamorous, but no less interesting, a few species have been found in mosquitoes from freshwater environments on Earth. In fact, the mosquito-obligate nematode Romanomyrmus colisivorax was sampled from a small pond near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and brought to a lab for evaluation a few decades ago. Here in this video, you see white, squiggly, free-swimming mermesid nematodes as they're looking for a host to invade. They hatched a day earlier and are moving around the water column in hopes of a chance encounter with the young mosquito larvae. Here you see a young parasite moving around and feeding inside an Aedes body. This video is taken under a microscope. Once safely inside the host body, the nematode makes a meal of the mosquito larvae's hemolymph, fat bodies, and non-essential organs. It's careful not to deplete its host body's energy reserves too quickly, as a premature mosquito death is a risk to the nematode and an outcome it would likely not survive. Here you see a young nematode snag a mosquito with its hooked tip, and it starts to bore through its exoskeleton. Here you see a young parasite moving around and feeding inside an Aedes body. This video is taken under a microscope. Once safely inside the host body, the nematode makes a meal of the mosquito larvae's hemolymph, fat bodies, and non-essential organs. It's careful not to deplete its host body's energy reserves too quickly, as a premature mosquito death is a risk to the nematode and an outcome it would likely not survive. Development of the mermithid nematode is more noticeable when it nears time to leave the host body. Having consumed all but the mosquito larvae's most vital organs, with space and food availability getting sparse, the juvenile mermithid migrates to the mosquito larva's thorax, where it surrounds the still functioning organs in a slinky looking coil. Her timing must be precise if she's to escape the confines of the host body before the mosquito pupates. Unfortunately for the mosquito, the injury from the alien nematode's escape also kills it. The adolescent nematode is now free and molts again to develop into an adult. It waits for its reproductive organs to mature, and then it's off to find a mate. A single mature female, Romanomyrmus colisivorax, can lay more than 2,500 eggs into the moist sub substrate every two to three weeks, and she can live for almost half a year. The eggs are referred to as cysts and can tolerate fluctuating moisture levels in the surrounding substrate by encapsulating. There they wait for water levels to flood the soil, then hatch, and are off to find the next unlucky mosquito larva. Let's have a look at some ferocious zooplankton. Along with three other families, copepods can be found in most marine and inland waters as predators, treat as foragers, and even as bizarre fish parasites. Copepods fulfill many ecological roles, some as detriment to us, and others that benefit. 
like miniature shrimp, cyclopoid copepods, or minuscule crustaceans that make up an important component of freshwater zooplankton communities. Although adults are voracious predators of similarly or even smaller sized aquatic creatures, they themselves fall prey to bigger arthropods and to small fish. The video here shows a small copepod colony in a jar in life size. With a little magnification, mature cyclopoid copepod females can be easily recognized by their egg sacs that are held at what one might call their waist. Knock lies, the larval offspring, are microscopic in size and they feed on ciliates. The potential for mosquito control was first realized a few decades ago, and only the larger species were found to be useful for killing very young mosquito larvae. The most predation and near elimination was achieved against container breeding aids. Owing to competition from other predators, the copepod generally killed fewer permanent water Anopheles larvae and even fewer stagnant and polluted, polluted water inhabiting Culex larvae. Therefore, successful application of copepods as mosquito biocontrols necessitate a match of copepod species to the right habitat and at the right time. As a rule, copepods cannot eliminate Culex production by themselves, but they can reinforce and augment control by other methods. In the search for relief from the irksome mosquito, the plant kingdom holds a few of its own kind as promised to reduce mosquito larvae in the margins of permanent water bodies. The roughly 220 members of the carnivorous plant genus Utricularia are collectively called bladderworts. They grow along the shallows of many nutrient deficient freshwaters and adapted over millennia to supplement their energy requirements by having turned the tables on the animal kingdom and became carnivores themselves. Five species occur in East Texas, varying in water chemistry tolerance, most can be found in the more acidic and nutrient-poor woodland ponds, marshes, and bogs. The majority of the plant, and the so-called business end, lies beneath the, wa beneath the water surface, and rising above the water is only necessary for sexual reproduction. The flowers stand well above the water and are brightly colored to attract pollinating insects. Mature seeds fall to the water and are carried off by it to grow elsewhere, where water birds pluck them off and dispersal happens later after digestion. Utricularia's underwater foliage still captures sunlight and through photosynthesis turns it into energy for the plant to use. A tangle of tiny bulbous booby traps grows on the foliage, each capable to capture and digest small aquatic creatures. The trap is set by forcing water out of the bulb thereby creating a partial vacuum within. Much like a depressed pipette or eyedropper bulb, once it's released, water quickly fills the bulb, taking with it the unlucky creature that brushed against the trigger hairs at the breakneck, lightning fast speed of 10 to 15 milliseconds. Though Utricularia can grow in dense mats, sporting thousands of traps, the plant themselves are habitat for small fish, tadpoles, and even larger arthropods like dragonflies and mayflies. But minuscule creatures like water daphnia, water nematodes, rotifers, and young mosquito larvae are readily preyed upon. Scientific studies show promising results for Utricularia as biocontrol agent of mosquitoes when planted in habitats that are not only harboring mosquitoes but are also conducive to the plant itself. Poorly draining and neglected ditches and decorative ponds without pumps benefit from the plant's introduction. The work at Harris County Precinct 4 Biological Control Initiative also includes conservation of beneficial arthropods whose biology is not conducive to large-scale lab rearing. Virtually unchanged for millions of years, dragonflies are expert predators above and below the water. Their fossil record is the most complete of any insect order, and quarried specimens embedded in shale and limestone date as far back as the oxygen-rich Carboniferous times in the Paleozoic era. To the casual observer, present-day animals closely resemble the likeness of their ancestral lineage. Odonata is the name for the modern-day insect order. It is divided into three suborders and comprised of close to 6,000 different species. All are predators of other arthropods as juveniles and adults. Anisoptera, the true dragonflies, are mostly robust and sturdy insects. In Psygoptera, the damselflies present themselves as fragile and dainty, but are neither. Damselflies and dragonflies occur in just about every region on Earth, but not necessarily near water. 
as some adults have been spotted many miles away from the nearest freshwater source. Some species, like the common green garners, migrate hundreds of miles every year to and from the tropical Americas to the U.S. Overall, dragonflies' diversity is richest in warm and tropical areas. The unique mating behavior of dragonflies includes territorial battles, courtship fights, and grasping heads. It culminates in a distinctive wheel-like formation where the female twists her abdomen forward and collects the male's sperm material from a pocket on his ventral side. Egg-laying behavior once again varies across the genera, where some females simply toss eggs, others drop basketful, some dip their ovipositor below the surface to adhere single eggs on substrate or vegetation, and a few even walk several inches below the surface to find just the right spot. Males may fiercely protect their preoccupied females by flying attached or alongside and fight off any would-be interloper, or they may perch nearby keeping a watchful eye on their gals, or in some species the males simply disappear after copulation is complete. Just as great a physical difference between the genera are the various hunting strategies employed. The darners, for example, are active hunters that chase down their prey with keen eyesight and quick mobility. Others, like some pond damsels, are more sluggish and depend on camouflage while clinging to vegetation. And the cruisers imitate flounders and cover themselves with mud, sand, and leaves and lie in wait beneath the substrate. The juvenile aqueous development covers 9 to 11 in stars that are also called wolves. Again, the duration is highly variable and can be as much as 2 to 3 years or as little as a month. The latter allows multiple generations per warm season and thus are, generally speaking, able to reproduce more quickly and therefore they're more commonly encountered. But while they're in the watery habitat, no nearby water flea nor mosquito larva will stand a chance. The common green darner nymph in this video showcases its unique bottom labium that's equipped with two movable tooth palps with which it snacks prey as far away as a third of its body length. The mosquito larvae and pupae in this clip are a welcome snack, and as it grows, it will be capable to catch small fish and tadpoles. The life cycle process is incomplete, meaning it skips metamorphosis that's in a separate pupal stage. Instead, gradual changes occur in the late instars and are visible by the size and length of the nymph's wing buds. Once ready, the nymph crawls out of the water and within minutes to hours, the freshly formed adult dragonfly will pull itself free headfirst from its previous exoskeleton. Leaving the watery habitat is necessary for dispersal to ensure diverse genetic material is available for propagation as inbreeding is not favorable for this group. As fresh tenera adults, their final colors will take days or weeks to develop. Territory must be fought for or new ones found that may be miles away. Many dangers lie ahead and making it alive to a new water system will include dodging insectivorous birds like martens and swallows, frogs, lizards, and even other dragonflies. Herself, the dragonfly adult preys on all sorts of diurnal winged insects, especially flies, gnats, and swarming ants. And if she doesn't fall prey herself, the whole cycle starts anew with male territory battles and mating rights won. Habitat degradation through the draining of wetlands and pond dredging and general water pollution by increased turbidity and pesticide runoff all play a role in a market reduction of many dragonfly species, especially those that are more selective in their habitat requirements. The state's wildlife action plans include odonata conservation and lists 440 of the known U.S. taxa a species of greatest conservation need. Here at Harris County, we're doing our part to include them in the planning aspects of wet bottom retention basin designs by incorporating various slopes, permanent ponds, and native plant material. To suppress mosquito populations and speed up the predator's population, we survey for and sometimes transplant dragonflies from similar but established waters to the new project. When warranted and ecologically appropriate, we may also include utricularia plantings along the margins to help snag the most persistent mosquito larvae. In his monumental work, The Origin of Species, Charles Darwin said, the amount of food for each species, of course, lies the extreme limit to which each can increase. But very frequently, it's not the obtaining of food, but the serving of prey to other animals, which determines the average number of a species. And in his footsteps, we enjoy sharing our passion for nature and biological controls in the research projects that we're involved in 
and we hope we've sparked an interest in you to learn more about the seemingly benign nature that's all around us and the complex thinking and strategizing needed to successfully harness that power and use it for good. A career in life sciences really only takes a curious and observing mind that's trained in the method of systematic scientific inquiry. So join us, a never boring, always challenging task awaits.